So Becca, today's guest has made me think about Aerosmith. And, Aerosmith. Oh, this and, is going to be a good conversation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, our, our guest today is a musician and made me think of my first co concert, which was Aerosmith. So back in my early high school days, I really got into Aerosmith um, because I guess for music, for me, a lot of co times comes down to the lyrics and then also how it makes me feel. So I'm, I'm into musicians from so many different genres, from Aerosmith to The Roots to Elton John, um, all across the board, jazz, classical. Um, so the lyrics are really matter a lot to me, but also how, like, I don't think I do very good at, like, connecting with my emotions. Mm -hmm. So, like, I know, I know if I'm happy, sad, bored, or stressed, Basics, right. <laughs> but, but I can't really get into it. So finding music that helps me, like, if I'm, if I'm sad, I want to hear some sad music <laughs> to help me. Well, oh, that's how you, so you don't use it to, to switch you the other way. You're like, no, compound my sadness with your music is what you yeah. say. Or yes, okay. I, sometimes I use it the other way to kind of like <laughs> kind of energize me to like actually do something, but most of the time not not as much. So I want I wanted to kind of learn from you what like what musicians uh, or genres are you drawn to and, and why? Uh, okay, well I don't know whether to be embarrassed about any of this or not. I'm just gonna own all of it. I think um, so. Um, I grew up in a house with a mom who was at Woodstock and the, all of my childhood music taste um, was all about listening to classic rock and true classic rock, not like 90s, you know, like real classic, classic rock, like Crosby, Stills and Nash and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the Beatles, whatever. And so that's the music I grew up listening to. Um, and because I didn't, we didn't listen to the radio. My mom always put on music. And so I really had very little idea until I was a teenager that there was other music out there. <laughs> and so we listened to a lot of that. And then when I got older, the first time I really feel like I identified with a genre myself was when um, grunge kind of hit the scene. And so somewhere is about 91, 92, I guess. Um, and that is my element. It sums up my personality. It sums up my musical taste, my fashion, my everything. Um, I just was really impactful in my life and it's never gone away to these to this day like I've tried to kind of have up-to-date styles and I, I, I don't I still wear my t-shirts and flannels and everything from that period so it's like uh, that's the clothes I'm comfortable in and what's really cool is now it's cool again there you notice it's come back so I'm cool all over again there you know and so that stuff never changed and a lot of my musical taste is based on around that time period um, but I was also like into kind of stoner music too. So I listened to a lot of Fish and I listened to a lot of Grateful Dead. Um, and that Grateful Dead was my very first concert. Um, and Fish was my second. <laughs> so that was sort of, you know, the genres that I'm, I'm kind of into. Um, yeah, I have a big thing about the grunge genre. It's one of my special interests and in, like that time period and everything. So Did you freeze? Are you okay? Oh, no, I'm back now. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, I thought it froze for a second. It looked frozen to me. Anyway, so yeah, that's sort of my genre of choice, I guess. Um, but I'm excited to bring our guest in and listen to what her kind of musical taste is. <laughs> because I love listening to what other people like, right? And kind of how it forms into their personality is always really interesting. Because now I think of you and I'll think of Aerosmith. And that's just the way that it is. <laughs> Dream on. So, <laughs> to welcome Buddy Angel to the podcast here to InfoDump. Um, she's a self-advocate, but she's also a writer and a musician and all kinds of other things besides just being an advocate. Um, and so I would love to have her on and have her join us right now with her interest in music. Um, please welcome Audie Angel. Yay. Hi. Um, Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> um, so I guess if I were talking about music, um, my first musical special interest was Elvis. <laughs> nice. I don't know why, but I just 
loved Elvis. It could be, so I think both my parents were autistic. They're both actually uh, musicians as well. So my dad um, grew up in the 70s, but his special interest, um, sorry, he was born in the 50s, but you know, he was around for the 60s and 70s. But during that time, he was super into 50s music, even though he was like a little older um, to be into that kind of genre. So that was his special interest was like 50s music, like the cruising music. And he grew up fixing old cars and the the band, do you know that, that band, the band? Yes. <laughs> they actually would practice um, where he grew up. And so he got to listen to them practicing growing up. So music was a pivotal part of his life and still is and so I grew up with 50s music and 60s and 70s classic rock kind of like you but Elvis something about Elvis <laughs> struck me <laughs> as a wee child That's awesome. uh, and I so I don't know I struggle with that a little bit because now I'm older and I realize that there's a lot of like controversy surrounding him and like may or may not have like stolen from the bi black community for you know, becoming the white musician, like that whole story. And it, it actually happened a lot in the 60s and 70s as well, um, with a lot of bands stealing music from Black creators. So I don't know how I feel about him now, but I loved him. I'm going off about this, sorry. <laughs> There's something about it, right? And we don't know why. We don't know what it is that makes that special interest click for us and like what it is. Yeah. But yeah, it just does. And we roll with it for a while. But I love how big the smile is on your face when you talk about how much you loved it. And that's the piece that I think people don't get to see with special interests. It's like this weird little thing that I really love and I don't kind of want to talk about it, but it makes me so happy. <laughs> and like you can't control it and keep it in because it makes you happy, you know? And so well, that's well. awesome. That was like, uh, I would say pre 10 years old. And I watched every movie he ever made and listened to every album. I have a record collection. Um, but when I became like a preteen, then it was all about the Beatles. I was completely obsessed with the Beatles. Like I needed to know everything there was. And I played um, the piano starting at six and someone gave me a Beatles uh, book that was all of their scores of music. And then I started playing trumpet at 13. So like I was learning all the Beatles uh, you know, tracks. <laughs> um, so yeah, Beatles took over from Elvis. And then when I became a teenager, I got super into punk and Riot Girl and Grunge. Um, Nirvana was one of my favorite bands, but also Nine Inch Nails. And then when I graduated high school, I was the lead singer for a Riot Girl band. And, you know, like Cedar Kenny Bikini Kill, that whole like thing, that phase, I was in that phase. <laughs> And that band was called Carrie Incognita. And you can still find our tracks on the internet, actually. Hey. Yeah. Awesome. I'm totally going to go listen because that's the music that I listen to. That's the, like time period and genre of music that I listen to. Um, yeah. Into, you know, classic rock. Angel, I, I read that you play like five or six or seven different instruments, which is amazing to me because I'm way too impatient just to even like learn one to. Uh, how, how does that happen? Uh, well, I started playing piano at five and I started doing recitals around, I would say six or seven. I was taught the green music theory of piano training, which is learning by ear, which I'm absolutely grateful for because now I know I'm dyscalculiac and um, I think in pictures and I have hyperphantasia. So I'm like, I just really struggle with like, reading music and I think it has I don't know if I'm correct but I think it's dyscalculia that makes me like flip notes and stuff <laughs> I don't even know if that's accurate but music theory is a lot like math mm -hmm. so because I learned music by ear I was able to use that that uh, ability to learn by ear on other instruments so that's how I did it so I I'm not actually like sitting down learning the music theory of the instrument. I'm more like emoting on the instrument through sound. And I'm also, um, I have alexithymia, 
So I have a feeling that music just like was a way for me to express all that I felt because I felt like a volcano when I was little and I didn't know how to get it out and music helped me to get it out. So any instrument I could get my hands on that made sound and could sound how I felt Mm. like I just wanted it. And I think that's why I play so many different instruments because I just want to make sound. That's my goal, I guess. (laughs) That's fantastic. No, it's really hard. I have Alexa Thymia too, and I don't know. I too was like a volcano, and it, people think you're like this angry person all the time, but you just are so confused inside, and it's all in there, and we feel big. Autistics, I think our emotions are big, so we feel big. So that's all trapped in there, and you're like, where does it go? Um, and so I absolutely vibe with that. I am not someone who does music well. Um, I can hear it well, but I can't do it myself because I'm so I'm coordinated. I cannot make my body do the things that I want it to do for that kind of thing. But I feel that way about music in general. That like most of my life, the way that I expressed my emotions was putting on a song because the lyrics and the music was the way that I could describe what was going on for me. So really yeah. simple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I have a feeling that's why I love the Beatles so much, actually, because. Um, when they got into their like Sgt. Pepper phase and they started like really layering tracks and doing backwards noise and all this stuff that hadn't been done before it was like I don't know there was there's so much detail and so much conflicting yet coalescing sound at the same time that like that's how I felt inside like I was a complete contradiction and yet I made sense because I exist and I don't know like Sergeant Pepper felt that way for me. <laughs> yeah. um, how can uh, how can people uh, listen to your music and purchase it? Uh, so I have a band camp, and um, I think it's Angel Crow. Let me just double check before I tell you what it is. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So it's Angel Crow, like the bird. Ah! Um, bandcamp.com. So angelcrow.bandcamp.com. That's how you find me. And I have like, I don't know, nine albums or something. Some of them are bands I used to play in, and then some are just my own recordings. Um, and they're more like diary entries or like journal entries than like I'm making an album to make it big or whatever. I, like music literally has just been a way for me to get out what I'm feeling. So I feel like embarrassed sometimes like I don't know if my music is like accessible but like that's not the point so that's okay so I have all these conflicting feelings about it (laughs) yeah because you create this thing and you want to share what you create there's that just need to share that you've created this thing and then of course the judgment that comes with the sharing is always uncomfortable (laughs) so yeah yeah that was a really really good crow sound I'm impressed I talk to birds um, a lot. (laughs) I grew up having pet birds and I think just growing up talking to them became normal for me. And um, so it's echolalia, right? When we copy sounds. So when I was a kid, I used to go through the holes at school and cluck like a chicken and just like make all the bird sounds. (laughs) And I think I did it because I loved the way the sound would bounce off the lockers, but it's all very like quite strange (laughs) this is a really good skill to have i mean that's part of the reason that you're a good musician and you can learn by ear right because it's that the observation of the auditory right it's really amazing yeah i actually love talking to chickens i have chicken opera actually that i sing to chickens and they really love it they're big fans um (laughs) that's awesome i you should make a chicken opera album what if other chickens out there are living a very sad life they have no entertainment at all. No, they're just stuck in their little cages. No, just <laughs> making eggs, no joy, none of that for them. How boring. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Unless they're in a happy farm, then they're probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you do something called the Audi Angel Coffee Hour. So anything relating to coffee I want to talk about. So... <laughs> Because I, I I go through my entire day with coffee, uh, nonstop. So, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about your coffee hour? Um, so I 
I started doing lives on Instagram once I developed enough courage because uh, I I am really shy and embarrassed about verbally speaking. <laughs> so a way that I found it easy for myself to go live was first I tried doing makeup because I, I it gave me something to do to distract me mm. from the fact that I'm like talking to people. But I don't like wearing makeup and it's sensory wise. It's like, ugh, I don't want this on my face. Uh, so I just started sitting down in the morning when I drink coffee and I actually have it here. Like this is my French press <laughs> yeah. and this is my creamer and this is my mug. <laughs> I have a different mug every day. So yeah, I just started doing lives while I drank my coffee in the morning and it just became the name of the thing. Cause that's what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. But I, also, I'm a professional barista, so like early in my 20s and then probably till my 30s, I worked in the winter as a barista. So I was trained by Stumptown and I know how to do all the fancy like latte art. And that's kind of a way I made a living for a long time. Um, and then I would garden in the summer. So I guess coffee is out a big part of my life as well. Um, and also, I think I'm ADHD as well as autistic. So coffee I think has been a way that I've coped with that um but because of my anxiety and stuff I did switch to decaf so I drink decaf coffee now <laughs> but I do drink a lot of decaf <laughs> oh, I, I'm just a coffee amateur I didn't realize you were a coffee professional that's a <laughs> right do I want her to come I want those the little heart <laughs> thing the heart thing inside your latte I want those and you know how yeah. to make them and that's so yeah. cool I've seen the videos that people do it. again not someone who's coordinated enough to do something. <laughs> yeah. As an adult, I realize that, uh, that coffee is a stim for me. Do you feel the same way? A stim like a stimulant or like? Just helps to like really regulates me. I, I almost feel like unsafe unless I have my coffee with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I feel like it could be a comfort for me. Um, but it's also part of my routine. So I wonder if it's like comfortable because it's a part of my routine. And mm. if I don't have it, I've messed up my routine. And then I get really anxious about that. Um, but ADHD doesn't like to have a routine. <laughs> so I fight myself all the time on this, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely, I like this. The smell of it is what really does it for me. So like, I can, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I could have coffee, not have coffee. But if my husband puts it on and I smell it being, then I'm like, okay, that has to happen. And then I just started looking forward to the smell. So I think now I just drink it because I like how it smells. That's <laughs> now where I'm at with it. Yeah, I, there is, um, I did, so I went to decaf and then I went to um, herbal coffee and I'm going to school at Commonwealth Herbs for herbalism right now. And I learned how to make what's called not coffee. So if you want to drink something in the morning, but don't necessarily want to drink coffee, coffee, it's like a, a nutritious uh, herbal drink that I tried to drink in the morning for a while, but I just love coffee so much. I wound up just putting the coffee in it as well, which you can do, but now I'm back to coffee again, but herbs are kind of expensive too. So it's hard to keep up with it. So, so what are some of your other special interests? Um, well, herbalism, I guess, because I just mentioned that, but that's a new one for me. So I'm still like feeling it out and I don't know a ton about it yet, but um, it was a nice segue from horticulture, which is I guess another special interest is growing plants. And I worked in the gardening industry since I was 22, 23, and I worked my way up to management, but I just got diagnosed with EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, so gardening as a profession isn't necessarily accessible to me. So I switched to herbalism. So I guess I would say plants are a huge special interest of mine. I absolutely love seeing them sprout from the earth and all their different stages of life and caring for them. Like I care for them like they're my pets. Um, I just love them. I love talking to them. I sing to them in the morning. <laughs> I sing them love songs. Plants must love uh, you. I am the worst plant person. It's terrible. I'm not good with plants at all. 
um, just animals. That's it for me and living creatures. But I really love to do, um, like, do you know how to do like uh, the walks when you do hikes and you can kind of pick out all the different kind of edible plants and all that. That's what I did. Like, I like the survivor part, survival part of it. Yeah, so, yeah, I love that as well. Um, I actually do some lives um, sometimes where I'll go into the woods and like start naming all the plants and telling people about them and like how you can harvest them, what's invasive. I also really love figuring out what's invasive to the land that you're living on so that you can, you know, remove it because invasive species kill, they basically drown out the native plants, um, which devastates the entire ecosystem because bugs and plants are where the ecosystem sort of starts. You know, so if you don't have, if the bugs don't have the plants to eat, the bugs die, then the birds don't have the bugs to eat, then they die, then the other predators that eat birds don't have that food and they die, the rodents die, the hawks die, everything dies. So yeah. it's really important to eradicate invasive species. So that's actually one of my focuses right now because my backyard is full of like highly invasive, super scary, you know, because you live in my sort of area regionally, uh, bittersweet and, um, the stuff that eats the trees. Um, oh, and Japanese knotweed. <laughs> I feel like I'm a nerd right now talking about this no. stuff. Isn't that sad? Though? That's like There's I'm some, supposed to be talking about like special <laughs> It is, but see, it makes us so happy, right? Like, the, like you could talk about this for hours, and that's the piece that this whole podcast is for. It's like, no, when we talk about this stuff, it's not like regular. It, we, we really enjoy it in a really deep way. And we'll share that joy with you if you let us, you know? And I love that piece of it. Because it's like, I know how you feel about that, even though I don't feel that way about the same thing, right? And it's just a yeah. really magical thing that happens for us on the spectrum that I don't think, we've always sort of looked at them as like, an, it's a negative part of being on the spectrum. It was always looked at as something we shouldn't do or whatever. Um, yeah. It's really important to our identity as a human. Um, and so, yeah, I love sharing that. Someone out there right now is going to be watching and going, I like that too, wait, and this thing and that thing. And you would have that magical conversation, right? With that person. Yeah. So it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting observation to like witness myself talk, you know, talking about my special interest, getting excited about it, but then having that voice that's like, wait, you're taking up too much space, this person's bored. Like that's how I've like learned to live, which is so sad. So it's awesome you've created the space for people to be able to like unleash that. Because <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're like, it's such an important part of us. And if people don't understand how, in, how important it is to us and our well-being, and they try to remove it from us and how really it's like an amputation. It's really very upsetting. Um, and it, yeah. then it really makes regulation difficult, all kinds of other things. And so it's important for people to see the joy that it brings us, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think too with ADHD, my special interests are all over the place, and that can be kind of difficult and challenging too, because um, mm -hmm. I can't decide <laughs> on one. <laughs> um, like I just took, I just took up pyrography, which is drawing on pieces of wood with uh, with a hot iron, basically, yeah. and like you do these like symbols. Um, this is a biking symbol. Um, I'm bad with names. And I already forgot what it, how to say it, but yeah, so I have that. I have painting. I have drawing. I have in my studio right now, like 25 different things that I'm interested in doing. So I kind of just say, I like art and then <laughs> everything kind of falls under that category. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. I'm also a metalsmith. So I have, it's so messy, but I could show it to you. My metalsmithing desk is over there. And I've been a metalsmith for probably 10 years now. Um, so I make things out of metal as well. So I, I just can't decide. <laughs> you shouldn't have to. You should just do all of them if you can, right? Just explore yeah. all of it. It's so great. <laughs> it. Keep doing all of them as long as they make you feel good. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to switch sometimes. Like I go through a rotation because you'll get... Like, I think it might be the ADHD, like, I'll get bored of something, and then I need to do the next thing. So it's like a psych like a wheel, like, I'll switch mm -hmm. from painting to drawing to pyrography to candle making to metalsmithing to herbalism. <laughs> right. But it's all of it is creation. It's all about the, the creation place. So I love it. I think it's it really makes sense together, all of those things. Right? Yeah. 
you meant you mentioned earlier about um, being diagnosed recently with EDS. So it just happens to be um, EDS Awareness Month. Um, so um, kind of where are you in that process of like figuring out things that might, you know, work with for you? Um, so I got diagnosed last month officially and I had to fight my primary care doctor to get my referrals because my primary care, when I told them that I thought I had EDS said, why do you need a diagnosis for that? There's no cure. So I'm currently in a battle with my primary care doctor to give me referrals and like why I need the referrals because mm -hmm. I think they just don't really understand what EDS is. And I have an insurance caseworker helping me navigate the healthcare system because it's actually like really challenging. Um, and my primary care doctor told me that, told my caseworker for my insurance that they don't want to be my primary care doctor anymore. And so she had to like convince her to keep me as a patient. And so that is where I'm at right now, it, which is highly frustrating because I've been trying to get this diagnosis for 15 years. I didn't know what EDS was before, and I was treated for Lyme disease. Mm. But my symptoms never went away. So I was like, oh, I just have post-treatment Lyme disease. But then I kept having like joint pain and physical therapy and injuries to my joints. And like that didn't, there is joint pain with Lyme disease, but it didn't explain all the other stuff that I deal with, because I also think I have POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and MCAS, or mast cell activation syndrome. And because it's a multi-systemic connective tissue disorder, it affects every single part of your body, from your eyes, to your digestion, to your skin, to your joints. And um, I just feel like there's not enough recognition by the medical community that we exist because they're taught in medical school that if you hear hoof beats behind you, it's probably a horse, not a zebra. So they look for the horses. They don't look for the zebras. And zebra is the symbol of EDS because we are the zebras. And they're like willfully not seeing us because they're taught not to see us. Um, so I think emotionally and mentally, I'm dealing with a lot of the same process that I dealt with through my autism diagnosis, which is looking back on my whole life, realizing like, oh my God, that was EDS. Um, just like I did when I got my autism diagnosis, like, oh my gosh, that was uh, autism. Um, the same thing is happening. Like I used to get sick on the playground uh, because of POTS. I used to pass out um, in, when I was a teenager. I would have fainting spells. So it's a lot. It's a lot emotionally and mentally to process a diagnosis like this, especially when you've known for a really long time and no one believed you. So there's this anger, like I have a lot of anger. Um, like I want to write every doctor that dismissed me and told me I needed to see a psychiatrist and send them a letter and say like, what the F? <laughs> right. Like here's the genetic testing and now we have to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, not only like a executive functioning hurdle navigating the healthcare system, but it's also a mental and emotional hurdle because having a late diagnosis of stuff is challenging, um, but also really validating. So, um, so yeah, now I'm trying to get a POTS diagnosis, an MCAS diagnosis. I need an echocardiogram to make sure my heart's working okay. And I'm waiting on the genetic testing to know what kind I have. And we're also trying to rule out a, a vein disorder that I don't remember the name of right now because my grandmother died of a brain aneurysm in her 40s so Ugh. it's, a, <laughs> it's lot, a lot right I mean this is this is the hard stuff and and people don't understand how traumatizing all of the invalidation is throughout your life when people just you know you know your reality and they tell you no that's not what it is um, yeah so it is. It's got to be really similar to that autism diagnosis. There's probably some grief and anger in there, I bet. I would be angry too. Yeah, for sure. Especially like the gaslighting by doctors is just like, they see autism and anxiety on the chart. And then they're like, I literally had a primary care doctor call behavioral health on me uh, when I was crying. And then six months later, an MRI showed that I have two partial tendon tears in my shoulder. And she didn't even do a physical exam. She just called behavioral health on me because I was crying. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of anger. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, um, not, I'm not sure how to transition from that subject <laughs> to this, this next one, but I do, I, I saw on your Instagram, uh, maybe it was from about two months ago, you were excited about getting a Hellboy patch. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you into comics much? Yeah, um, I love comics. I guess that would be another special interest of mine. Um, mostly when it comes to, I guess, mainstream media, I tend to like the more independent stuff. I ran a music arts and literature magazine for a while for do-it-yourself artists. Um, so I love up-and-comers and independent artists. So when I first got into comics, I worked at uh, New England Comics in Boston. And well, that's not when I first got into them. Sorry, that's the first job I had in the comic industry. And then as a teenager, I was completely obsessed with Tank Girl. Like I loved Tank Girl. She was amazing. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, um, when I worked at the comic book store, I was mostly interested in independent comics. I really liked Dark Horse and Image and that kind of thing. And um, um, I think it's... Mike, is it Mike Minola? I'm really, really bad with names. I'm sorry. Even though it's my special interest, I can't remember names of stuff. Um, I'm just looking at the name of the creator. Mike Mignola. So I met him at a comic convention because Hellboy is one of my favorite comics. Um, I think I found it when I was working at the comic book store, just picked up and started reading it. But my favorite... Um, character from the comics is the girl who can do flames um like I said I'm really bad with names so I have to look it up <laughs> unless you guys know but I, I don't, don't know. know hellboy character flame <laughs> flame isn't this silly this is one of my favorite characters and I can't remember the name like this Poppins. is how bad at names I am Elizabeth Sherman I Googled it. Um, <laughs> I feel like I have name blindness. You know, people have face blindness. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have name blindness because I literally cannot remember the names of things. And ever since I was little, I would come up with like made up names of stuff because I couldn't figure out the name. <laughs> yeah. So side tangent, oh, Elizabeth Sherman um, has depression because she accidentally set her family home on fire and killed her parents while she was sleeping. And so she is in and out of inpatient facilities dealing with that. And at least in the movies, I don't know enough about the comic, um, but she's one of my favorite characters because she was the first character I saw written that had mental health issues included in a way that was like sort of respectful. Like, I really like the way Mike Mignola um, approached it and included a character that really struggled with mental health stuff. And I really related to her because I, I did feel like I'd an inferno that I was going to like burst into flame at any point. And, you know, I felt like an outcast of societal reject. So, you know, Hellboy is, is a demon, you know, societal reject. Like, he's not allowed to be a hero. He's the anti-hero because he comes from hell, but he's actually fighting for good. So there's a lot of like, um, of that kind of like comparison in Hellboy that I just really love and relate to because that's how I felt growing up. That's how I feel even still. And um, so yeah, Hellboy touches a, a place in me. <laughs> not that I'm like a Satanist, I don't know, I'm not. <laughs> No, listen, we, we've talked about my special interest. I have a special interest in true crime and serial killers, and that doesn't make me a serial killer. So we are all allowed to have our interests. Um, and so, yeah, sharing that stuff is important. I'm, I'm really, um, I really enjoy that we're able to share all of this stuff because even people knowing that there's a piece of embarrassment, a piece of shame that comes from past trauma when we talk about the things we love. Like that's how embedded it is in us to be ashamed of our joy. And I just think we just have to keep doing this. So we stop feeling so ashamed of all of the weird things that we love. Right. So yeah. 
Do we have more questions, Doug, or are we ready for our little thingy, our inside yeah, the I, autistic I, studio? Yeah, I think we're ready for the inside the autistic studio. So there's 11 questions for you, Angel. Um, so the first question is, what are your pronouns? Um, they, she, I have, so, I haven't ever really like talked about this. Um, I changed my Instagram to include that I am non-binary and I'm still really like struggling with, do you call it coming out of the closet? <laughs> I don't know, uh, but let's call it that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was like horrifically bullied as a kid. Like I was a kid people picked on. Uh, so yeah, I, I have to battle a lot of like self shame, I think. And it's it feels scary to be vulnerable to say, this is who I am. This is where I feel safe. This is what makes me feel comfortable because my whole life I was taught that it was more important to make other people comfortable. So <laughs> I feel comfortable with they. Um, I always felt weird in my body, but I don't, I don't wanna be male that's not what it feels like for me it just feels like I kind of wish I was a mannequin <laughs> okay no that's a really cool way to describe it it yeah. feels really weird and scary to say though um like I felt like when I went through puberty that my body like betrayed me um but not because I wanted to be male not that there's anything wrong with that that's just not me um, so that's why I felt non-binary fit. Um, and I, I heard another advocate talk about it once and they were like, um, uh, it felt like when they were being really, really feminine and wearing lots of makeup and dresses and all the shoes and all the stuff, it was like cosplay for them. Mm -hmm. And that's how it feels like for me. So I'm female, but it feels like cosplay and I feel more comfortable in androgynous clothing. Um, and it was a tangent, kind of. <laughs> oh, it's, but, it's an important piece, right? I mean, we know our numbers on the spectrum. We know that our population is high on that stuff. And I think, um, you know, I don't know that I'm in a place where I would say that I'm non-binary, but I feel a lot of the similar things. I feel, I always describe it as saying, I feel like pinky in the brain, right? And I'm like, I'm the brain and I need, like my body is, is just a, uh, like a tool that carries my brain in it is how I feel all the time. I don't feel um, attached to my physical body and gen either gender. I feel nothing either way. Um, would like to get rid of my bra, but that's a sensory issue and that has nothing to do with like whether I feel male or female. Like I've never wanted to change bodies, but I really would have loved it if just like nothing happened. Like, can it just be healthy and carry me around and get me to where I need to go? And, and that's it. Um, and so I feel really similarly, and I think a lot, I wonder how much of the gender stuff um, we deal with, if uh, we deal with it so much because we're so uncomfortable in those kinds of changes that happen to your body and puberty and all of that stuff. Because um, there's a lot of sensory things that happen through that process too. Um, oh yeah, so oh, God, I absolutely hated it. Yeah. It was like traumatic. Yeah. To go mm -hmm. through puberty. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard. And like, we wonder, like, we have all these kids that are going through the same thing right now, right? And we, we don't talk about this part. Nobody talks about, how, I mean, it's another transition. We don't just transition from middle school to high school, like our entire body transitions on us. And if you're not prepared, and, and so much more work comes with, with your body when you get, when you hit puberty, right? There's so much more to do. Um, and so much more self-care and so I think and we don't address sensory that. like right? from a female perspective there's so much sensory stuff like pads tampons underwears yep. like uh, bras uh, uh ew, just <laughs> yeah, just all of it right it's just really and so you're I mean all the whole thing and it's distressing and I feel like it's a distressing transition for every single human being on the planet like there's no way to prepare someone <laughs> for what is about to happen to their body and inside there's just no matter what you say it's like really changing skins almost and so we have to do better with that especially for our autistic kids they need better and they need yeah. to know that they don't have to do these things right that the way the right way whatever 
Okay, sorry, we went on a tangent from the pronouns it question. Was great, it was, it was a great tangent. Uh, what is your preferred STEM? Well, right now I'm doing this. This is actually a, wank, a wax stamp for envelopes. <laughs> um, I think because I grew up not knowing that I'm on the spectrum, I just grab stuff and fiddle with it. So like I have fidget toys, but they're not something I go to because I think I grew up not knowing I'm autistic. Um, like I could have a pencil as a stem just by rolling it around in my fingers and like pinching the eraser. Um, so I would say fiddling with objects would be a good way to define that. <laughs> and what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Too much pressure. <laughs> bother dash. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Um, all right. Who do you love and what are you doing about it? Uh, like in my personal life? <laughs> well, I'm uh, engaged to my partner, Brian. <laughs> um, and I never like talk about this stuff. Ah. <laughs> You're a person under there. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess we live in a house and have two dogs <laughs> and we eat food. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to eat food each day. That's, that's a good change. Uh, so, so these next two are fill in the blank. Uh, you may be neurotypical if uh the truth makes you angry yes oh that was a good one <laughs> and then you may be autistic if um oh my god <laughs> This is hard. I wanted to say the truth makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, but this is not my origin. This is Harry Thompson PDA um, made a TikTok about it. And like, that's the fundamental difference between us. And I just feel like that wraps it up so well that I don't know what else to say, except that truth makes us feel good. And truth makes neurotypical people feel angry because they don't, they're not direct and like super honest, but that's what we crave and want for the most part, if it's done nicely-ish. <laughs> What's something you want to learn or to be better at? Uh, my initial thought is I have spent my whole life trying to improve myself, which comes from both a good and bad place, I would say. Um, I fundamentally want to be the best version of myself possible. So I ceaselessly work on myself, but I don't want that to come across like I'm a perfectionist. I am, but I'm not in like a self-harming way. I just feel like I have this time on this planet and I want to make things better here. And in order to make things better here, I have to make things in, within my own landscape better. Um, so I want to be the best version of myself possible, I would say something I want to learn how to do. <laughs> I very much feel that. Um, what, what autistic social media account should people be paying attention to? Um, Harry Thompson, PDA extraordinaire. I really um, have learned a lot from him. Um, I feel like I am um, PDA, pathological demand avoidant autistic. Um, so I really love that account. I love the Chronic Couple. Um, they do a lot of like EDS autistic advocacy. Um, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, for EDS, if you're interested in learning more about hypermobility and EDS, I would follow Bendy Bodies. They're on Instagram and they have a podcast as well. Uh, and, oh God, I'm bad at names. Those are great ones. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, and I, I've, if you could, I would try and find all of the BIPOC creators that you possibly can and follow them um, and nonverbal creators, but I'm, I'm not good with names, so. <laughs> What's one thing in your routine you couldn't possibly live without? Well, no. <laughs> Rest. Yeah. Dog, cat, or must I choose? I don't want to choose. <laughs> if I had to go for my allergies, it would be dogs because I'm allergic to cats. But I love cats and they teach us about boundaries and they have really firm boundaries and we need to learn from them, not hate them. <laughs> and then the last question, what does autistic joy mean to you? Uh, fireworks, uh, the sunset sparkling on the ocean, um, the wind going through the trees, leaves, the sound of sand blowing on the desert, um, the sound of waves. Um, it's all very like sensorily related to me, I think. Um, that feeling of peace when you're researching or doing the thing you love where, so we're talking about music earlier. It's like, there's this moment when a band is playing together where it feels like the music takes over and you're no longer creating it. It's just being born. Um, and there's this vast sense of peace when there's a group of people creating music together that moves you to tears. So like, that feeling is what special interests feel like, I think, for me. This, like, moving crescendo of peace and joy. And maybe what a lot of the enlightened people have talked about, that moment of enlightenment, kind of, would feel like. <laughs> I love it. You shouldn't, see, I love, everything that you say is so beautiful. I think it's just so, um, it describes the experience in this really visceral way, right? We add, you, all of your stuff was so sounds, right? Sound related. And for yeah. me, it's, it's like, um, it's like I don't, it's, it's, it feels like a detachment from my body, if that makes any sense. So when I'm at that peace place that you're talking about, when we're really at peace with our special, and we're just in that zone, um, I don't feel like I'm trapped in my body. Like I don't feel stuck in this world. I'm just like free to be myself. Um, and so it is, it's, it's a great way to describe it. And I thought it was really beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, are we, is that the last one, Doug? That was, that was it. I, love how I don't know which is the last question anymore. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us today, Angel. I really appreciate getting to know you, your special interests. Um, if you are not following her, please follow her. Um, she does really amazing, amazing, accessible stuff where you feel like she's talking to you and not to the whole world. Um, so check out her Instagram. Really, really great. She does her coffee hour and fun stuff. Um, and I hope we'll see you around doing other things. Um, and I hope we'll have you back to talk about more stuff. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.